The first time I met Gemma, I immediately knew there was something wrong. Here was a young individual who, rather than enjoy life, would spend her days curled up in a ball on the couch. More heartbreaking was her obvious fear and anxiety, which manifested itself in avoidance, emotional numbness, and hypervigilance. Meet Gemma, my rescue dog. Born on the street, it is believed that she may have watched her siblings die and was likely brutalized herself. Her resulting symptoms parallel those seen in human PTSD patients, so it is my personal belief that she is suffering from a canine version of the disorder. Sadly, Gemma's story is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to mental illness in non-human animals, and this iceberg is what I'm here to help chip away at today. Many people in the scientific community often warn against anthropomorphizing or attributing human thoughts and feelings to non-human animals. However, anthropomorphizing is not a problem in and of itself. Rather, what's important is that we anthropomorphize in a logical and meaningful way. In doing so, we can not only learn more about ourselves and other animals, we can also avoid falling prey to anthropocentrism, which is the philosophical belief that humans are the central or most significant entities in the world. Charles Darwin himself was the first to acknowledge that both human and non-human animals share six primary emotions, anger, fear, disgust, surprise, sadness, and happiness. Evolutionarily speaking, these internal states developed because they help individuals make sense of the world by allowing them to assign emotional significance to certain events. Similarly, scientists have found that limbic regions such as the amygdala and hippocampus, which underlie emotion, are found in many different species. Interestingly, these brain regions and the emotions that they produce often underlie mental disorder in humans, and as we're beginning to discover, other animals as well. For example, one study compared the behavior of sanctuary chimpanzees who had experienced sustained confinement violent human interactions or laboratory testing to those of their wild counterparts. The authors found that 58% of sanctuary chimps met the revised criteria for major depressive disorder, while only 3% of wild chimps did. Similar results were found for PTSD, in which 44% of sanctuary chimps and only 0.5% of wild chimps met the criteria. While these results may surprise you, scientists have actually known about the existence of complex emotions in other animals for a while now. In fact, they often capitalize on this homology in order to further the fields of psychiatry through the use of animal models, such as acrylic in dogs for OCD, separation-induced depression in monkeys, and mice models of anxiety. The significance of these models is that in using them to better understand mental illness in humans, we are indirectly acknowledging that other animals share similar psychological experiences with us. However, being the anthropocentric species that we are, we often don't think about it this way. For me, removing this anthropocentric lens has allowed me to treat Gemma's condition like the canine equivalent of PTSD, which has proven to be very beneficial. Over time, a combination of patience and gradual desensitization, similar to exposure therapy used to treat human PTSD patients, has revealed her to be an intelligent and mischievous dog. Outside of personal experience, stories of mental illness in other animals sometimes pop up in the media. When they do, we tend to find them interesting because we think they are unique or stand alone, when in reality, they are much more common than we might think. Take the story of Flint a chimpanzee from Jane Goodall's famous F family. After his mother Flo passed away, Flint stopped eating and became withdrawn, choosing to spend all of his time staring absently into space, all symptoms consistent with major depression. Then we have Gus, the polar bear from the Central Park Zoo. When, when visitors started to worry about Gus's mental health, the zoo brought in a behaviorist who was able to gradually decrease Gus's compulsive swimming behavior through a combination of environmental enrichment and the antidepressant fluoxetine, better known as Prozac. Finally, we have Javi, who by the time she was rescued from her original owners had managed to pull out all of the feathers on her body. Overgrooming, which parallels trichotillomania or hair plucking disorder in humans, is commonly observed in animals who've experienced stress, boredom, or neglect. So considering all of the examples that I've presented to you today, have you noticed a recurring theme? 
More often than not, we humans are the cause of other animals' distress. As such, it is up to us to be more cognizant of how we interact with other animals and how our choices can affect them. Maybe instead of simply using Prozac as a band-aid to treat neurotic polar bears or prescribing Valium to emotionally unstable gorillas, we should focus on treating the underlying causes of their distress, just like we do in humans. So if other animals, like Gemma, Flint, Gus, and Javi can also suffer from mental illness, what makes humans different? Although it may be hard for us to admit that we are not as special as we once thought, Dr. Carl Safina makes an important distinction. He says, what makes us human is that we are the most extreme. We are the most compassionate, the most violent, the most creative, and the most destructive animals on this planet. Therefore, the question is no longer what separates us from other animals, but rather, do we humans have enough intelligence, rationality, creativity, compassion, and empathy to help them? I would like to think that we do. Thank you.